So hello to you from Sark on this beautiful August evening here in the Channel Islands. So while on holiday here this week, I stumbled across a book in the local post office called Silver Mining on Sark by David Sinnott. And it describes an ill-fated mining operation on this island between 1836 and 1847. And I love this about books. I'm walking up a hill at the moment, so if I start getting a bit panty, I apologise. But you find these weird, quirky old books sometimes, and they, their books are distilled information. And you can find stuff in old books sometimes that you, you still, it never got uploaded. And uh, this book in particular has just got a wonderful story to it with a wonderful moral. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, uh, runs the old French saying. Apologies to any French speakers for my pronunciation. And it applies to mining, it seems, as much as anything. Um, we may not use canaries anymore, and mines are powered by diesel and electricity instead of horse and manpower. Helmets have torches instead of uh, candles on them. And there's underground lighting. And a higher premium is placed on human life than in the early 1800s when workers were much more disposable. But the game is exactly the same. You are trying to extract metal from rock and sell it at a higher price than you mine it for. The tricks of the trade, the scams, they're the same too. So let me tell you the story of Sark's silver mine. Sark, by the way, is a tiny island about two miles square, located between Guernsey, just over there, and Jersey, just over there, uh, in the English Channel. Much closer to France, which is 25 miles in that direction, than it is to England, which is 200 miles away over there. So there in the distance is Jersey, and as we pan round to the left, can't really make it out. You might just be able to make out France. I can make it out with the naked eye, but I don't think my camera is picking it up. And then we pan round and we're looking back at ourselves on Sark. Beautiful, huh? And remains show the island was inhabited in Neolithic times during the Bronze Age, but for many periods in the island's history there was nobody here at all. Today it has around 500 residents. There are famously no cars on the island. Um, only tractors, horses, bikes and uh, mobility scooters and no street lights giving you one of the best views of the night sky in Europe, probably the best view. It's famous for its harsh windswept landscapes with sheer cliffs and jagged rocks. There's some sheer cliffs and jagged rocks for you. It still has a feudal lord <laughs> who I beat at table tennis and its own parliament. So here is a prehistoric tomb. Uh, this is from the Bronze Age. It's a dolmen, and it would be you would have two megaliths, megalithic supports on either side, two columns with a flat um, stone on top, and that would be a tomb from the Bronze Age, from the Neolithic era. How about that? On this uh, magnificent headland, looking out to the south. And uh, there have what some rabbits have got to say on the matter. <laughs> Less impressed than me. In the early 1800s, the language spoken here, the, the Patois, was similar to Old Frankish, it's actually a Germanic language. Very different from the Cornish, spoken by the miners who would soon settle here. And if you take a boat trip around the island, you can see copper salts leaching in the cliffs. I'm not going to go down there now, it's a bit steep, but I'll, I'll upload a, fo a, a photo that I've taken of, uh, from, the, from a boat. That visible copper no doubt explains the appeal of the island during the Bronze Age, and it was these visible salts that attracted prospectors to the island in the early part of the 19th century. Now the Cornish at the time had one of the most evolved mining cultures in the world, also dating back to the Bronze Age. And they were operating mines all over the world, in Argentina, in North America, 
especially in California, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Virginia. In Chesapeake, they even have a Cornish accent. <laughs> And uh, in South Africa, where they operated the world's largest copper mine at Okiep, 300 miles north of Cape Town. And even the great Mark Twain, he of a mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing next to it fame, was of Cornish descent. And in 1835, funded by an English mining adventurer called John Hunt, adventurer is a much better term than entrepreneur, I love it, an adventurer, a team of Cornish miners arrived on the island um, in 1835 to mine the copper. And they started mining pretty much here on the cliffs below me. You can't even see them. Let me get another better shot. Just over there. About 800 yards away, they found lead and silver nearby and they began mining that too. And so raising money in Guernsey and London with lots of promises of future riches, was Sark's Hope Mine built. They should have called it the No Hope Mine. It prospered for a bit, but was what was prospering four years later in 1839 started going badly wrong. How? In the age-old tradition of mining, management misled the shareholders. When the ore body was clearly no longer enough to support the mine, the mine captain deceived where possible to keep the game going. Management had a vested interest in doing so, even if it was no longer profitable. Some two Cornish, 200 Cornish workers were employed by the mine, together with their wives, who may also have been employees, they were called ball maidens, they were known as, uh, and their families. Sark's population soared to 790, the highest ever recorded. And as they chased ore, expanding the mine with the promise of finding more silver, uh, um, mine veins extended as far as 800 yards and 300 feet out to the sea. Let's go and have a look at the sea. There's the remains of another of the old chimneys. And I, th they, I think just over there, there's another. But they were mining 300 feet out to sea in that direction. Sorry, the light's very bright, but you can see it's quite calm now, the sea, but it can get very rough. So those mines out there at the sea, excuse the bad light again, I'm, I wish I had a proper cameraman, but I'm afraid it's just me. They were 300 foot out to sea, they were mining 20 fathoms, 120 feet below sea level, and you can imagine the noise in those tunnel when, tunnels when there's a storm blowing overhead, waves crashing and all the rest of it. Imagine how terrifying that would be. And they actually had quite an ingenious device, oops, sorry, in play, should the mine ever flood, that would save the mine and <laughs> some of its occupants. There were still many who died there. But it was quite, they needed general equipment could be brought in from Guernsey, but there was quite a lot of specialist equipment and that had to be acquired from Cornish suppliers, uh, with the effect that Guernsey and London shareholders capital made its way <laughs> to the picks and shovels suppliers in Cornwall. And management would go on jollies to Guernsey for their count house dinners, a tradition they'd brought over from Cornwall. And these dinners had acquired legendary status for their extravagance. News of the mine would be delivered to shareholders in Cornwall, by the way, the Count House was the, the mine office, basically, where the managers worked and where the uh, miners were paid. Now, mining has a long and rich history of this. I remember the boom of the noughties, and you'd see management of non-producing exploration companies living it up at the Savoy, driving Ferraris to expensive lunches and dinners, and you were like, who's paying for this? And... <laughs> The cost of those dinners would be buried in the company accounts. I'm back to the um, Cornish now. And one out adventurer noted that he couldn't see the spirits. An out adventurer, by the way, is a shareholder. And this is just a story from Cornwall, but he noted he couldn't see the spirits from a recent count house dinner in the accounts. And the bursar, or what we might today call the CFO, declared that the spirits are there. You just can't see them. <laughs> There was also a long Cornish habit of swindling 
uh, investors, out adventurers from London and it seems they took that habit with them to Sark. Now of course sometimes mines work and everybody makes a lot of money and that, that's the same lure that draws people in and will always draw people in. It's when they don't that things go wrong. Um, now none of this is to say that working in the mines were easy. You know, many lost their lives to it. 20% of Cornish miners were killed or incapacitated before they reached the age of 40. And Cornwall actually became known as the County of Widows as a result. If you saw someone's window open in Cornwall in winter, it was likely that the occupier was a former miner gasping for air as his lungs were so damaged from breathing in the dust of thousands of gunpowder explosions. As things went wrong in the early 1840s, the seigneur of Sark, the feudal lord, borrowed money to try and keep the business going. But in 1847, the business finally collapsed. The seigneur lost a lot more than his shirt. He died a year later, crushed with debt, and his creditor, one Marie Collins, foreclosed on the debts, and his son lost the fiefdom to her. The son, Peter Carey would become a low-life scamp, uh, to quote the probably biased archive of the seigneury. And Sark got a new seigneur, a dame actually, and that same family retains the fiefdom to this day. And the mine has never been reworked or re-explored now, it's all grown over, as you can see. <laughs> but the moral of the story is don't use leverage to invest in silver mines. Now, irony of ironies, in Guernsey, there is still a record of all the money paid out to shareholders. But those that recorded the company's income have been lost. The episode had some long-term effects on the island. For a period, there was an influx of capital, prosperity with the mining boom, then depression with the bust. It brought Methodism to the island, a school for girls and a doctor. It kick-started the tourist industry and the area around the mine, previously just heath, began to be farmed just beyond the farm. The English language came to the island. Some of the houses that were built for the mine workers housed the Sarkees for many decades to come. Apparently because they weren't built by the Cornish but by the locals, so they were built with more longevity in mind. There's a wonderful passage I found by a local historian called Edgar Barnes in 1890 and he said in this spot centred anticipations never to be fulfilled and hopes doomed to dire disappointment. At the bottom of the mine lie the buried fortunes of an ancient family, the hard-earned savings of people who had little to spare and the wasted energies of hundreds of stalwart men who had hoped to share in the wealth which their efforts were to have won. And now all has vanished, as if it had never been, save that there still remain ghostly monuments of failure, the shafts and the chimneys and the ruins of the various offices. This is a story that has played out many times through the history of mining, and it still plays out today. Investors, investors I should say, caveat emptor. And if you're interested in buying actual silver and gold rather than mining shares, I'll, I'll put a link in the comments to a bullion dealer I like. It, it's safer to buy bullion than it is mining companies. Thanks very much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. I'll be back with another video very soon. And also look out for my show on weights and measures. I'm doing a short run in London in September. I'll put links in the comments. It'll be great to see you there. It's basically a rerun of the Edinburgh show. But uh, cheerio, I'll leave you with some shots of the view.